Welcome to another edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis. Today, I'm honored to have Charles Cruz, who is doing something special. He's running for Congress 128. Talk to me about uh, who you are, Chuck. Welcome to Politics and Right. So uh, just to make sure, uh, I'm running for the Texas House of Representatives, House District number 128, which covers uh, Baytown, Deer Park, Laporte, uh, Crosby Highlands, basically the eastern portion of Harris County. Uh, I am a chemical engineer. I uh, got my degree from Texas A&M in 2005. I spent almost a decade with bare material science before it became Covestro and then went to the insurance industry, traveling all over America to evaluate petrochemical facilities for safety and reliability because we did not want to pay a check when they had a fire explosion. So making sure that we custom tailor the insurance risk and understand what each individual uh, client had. That was my job for years. So making sure that plants run better, cleaner and safer has been my whole career. And now I'm trying to get to Austin where I can pass laws, hopefully, to make all the plants in Texas run better, cleaner and safer, not just the ones that I happen to be visiting that day. Now, interesting, uh, before we get into the politics, et cetera, sure. I, I want folks to really understand uh, what you just said. You are, being, you are representing an area that, I, that too often uh, the chemical companies, the oil companies don't, are, are not, as, if not necessarily efficient, don't do the right things by the people in the community. In other words, too often, there are things let go in the air. Too often, there are things let go in the ground, hits the groundwater, et cetera. In fact, if I recall correctly, many of those areas, they are predominantly, uh, they predominate many diseases that you don't have or that isn't prevalent elsewhere, correct? There are a lot. Uh, the incidence rate for illnesses such as cancer, respiratory illnesses, all the different Forms that that takes, asthma and so forth, uh, there are higher incidence rates here. And like you said, all of these companies are businesses. They are here for one thing and one thing only, to make money. And I understand that. However, there is a way to make money and take care of your business responsibly and safely. And we, I want them to choose more on the side of safety and reliability than on the side of profit. Exxon, Chevron, uh, a lot of these big players are posting absolute record profits. So anytime somebody says, oh, we can't afford to implement XYZ project, it's it's almost certainly BS. They're posting billions and billions and billions in profits. So there's plenty of money to be used sensibly to make sure that what they are processing stays in the pipes, doesn't get leaked, and that emissions are responsibly controlled. Um, it's just a fact of life living out here, unfortunately, that uh, you get to learn that one of the things that happens, I'm not gonna say monthly, but several times a year, uh, you'll see a large plume of smoke from a fire, an explosion. You'll wonder, did somebody go to the hospital or did somebody go to the morgue? Because fatal accidents absolute, absolutely do happen in these industries. Uh, this, these are very high risk jobs sometimes, and it doesn't have to be that way. So the push for safety has always been a struggle between profits and uh, trying to make sure that people return home at the end of the day safely and healthy. Uh, and we're always wanting to move the needle just a little bit more, uh, trying to move the ball forward. And make sure that we are taking those next steps. Remember, there was a time when cars didn't have seat belts. There was a time when cars didn't have airbags. And at every step of the way, there was somebody in industry who said, oh, we can't possibly afford that. We can't possibly uh, implement this. We can't let people know that it's dangerous to drive a car. Well, once they owned up that, yes, this is a risk, but we can manage that risk, we can mitigate that risk, with science and engineering practices and better management practices, we absolutely can deliver safer, cleaner products. And then I wanna be clear, these products are something that are vital to the life that we all enjoy. The shirt that I'm wearing has fibers that are made artif from artificial materials. The buttons are plastic. The computer that I'm talking to you on is made from plastics and petrochemicals. We need these things 
but we need them to be made to the highest possible standards of safety, reliability, and making sure that these corporations are good neighbors for the surrounding communities and the people that work inside. So as a, one of the, you know, I've said this for a long time, especially representatives in certain areas, I think should be engineers or, or at least science-based, because again, you can hold that discussion in front of your constituents where you can tell them when, when, when they have the spinners coming in to, to convince them that this is unnecessary, you can actually lay out not just facts because, you know, engineers love facts, but most people necessarily don't, but you can express it. One thing, the difference between engineers and scientists, engineers can generally express something in a manner that the average citizen, the average constituent can understand. Now, tell me a little bit about the 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 uh, the political demographics of the area that you are attempting to represent. I'm going to say that there are at least two different opinions. Um, so there is the traditional opinion that this is a very red area, but this is like a lot of Texas, a low voter turnout area, and for reasons I can't really get into. The Democratic Party has not had an, a significant presence here in a very, very long time. So I live personally in what I call a triple red district. I have a congressperson, uh, Brian Babin, who is a Republican. I have a state senator, Brendan Crichton, who is a Republican. And the guy that I'm running against for State House 128, Briscoe Kane, is a Republican. All three of those are Republicans, very far right Republicans. Um, but there are a significant number of Democrats in this area. And in 2020 was the first time that a Democrat had run for House District 128 since I want to say it was 2004. So we're talking very, very close to 20 years when there was not even somebody on the ballot to vote for. And when voters in the area feel abandoned by their party, they lose interest. They essentially stop showing up. And so the problem exacerbates where folks don't turn out. And then so it is perceived that it is a redder area than it actually is. I believe that this is a very purple area. There's a great opportunity to uh, get folks motivated. I've been out knocking doors since February. And um, I have had several folks tell me, I can't believe a candidate is knocking on my door, number one. And number two, I can't believe a Democratic candidate is knocking on my door. Um, and I've had, <laughs> honestly, I've had a couple of people get emotional because they felt as I once felt. So I moved to the Baytown area in 2006. And I similarly believe that this was just absolutely dyed in the wool red area and that I was alone. I was the only one for a hundred miles. Mm -hmm. Clearly not the case. There are absolutely people uh, that are on the Democratic side and tend to vote in that manner, but the Republican side has been loud and uh, honestly, I'm going to say it, uh, aggressive. So there aren't folks running around with big jacked up trucks that have Biden flags. There aren't folks running around with uh, stickers all over their car talking about how much they love the Democratic Party. And I'm trying to change that. I know that the voters are out there. I know that they felt the way that I once felt. I must be the only one. I'm the lone person in this sea of red, and it's simply not the case. There are tens of thousands of voters out there. And I know this because in 2020, the candidate that run, I very much appreciate uh, Mary Williams for having run, but I don't believe that she campaigned very hard and still managed to get a very impressive turnout of around 22, 23,000 votes for not a lot of ground game. And so I know that with a stronger campaign, I can build on that. And while I recognize that I've got a very tall hill to climb, there's a significant point gap to, to make up. I intend to narrow that gap even if I don't win. I want to cut the deficit in half, in a third, in a quarter, uh, and narrow that gap because even if we don't make it in 22, we absolutely can in 24. But we need to get out there. We need to get talking to folks and let them know, yes, Democrats are here. They could be four doors down, and you just didn't know because you've, like I once felt, 
felt very alone. Now, much of the media that the the people in your district, if, if it's very red, likely listen to, generally makes a caricature out of Democrats. Generally, makes a caricature out of of um, of progressives. And yep. what happens then is that people internalize that, and it becomes their reality. And you have to break through that prism. My question to you then is, uh, how do you break through the prism? Uh, first of all, we know that some in the in, in in Democratic Party and likely the Republican Party, they like to make things base election. So in your case, since they have some number they've applied to your district, they figure base election uh, absolutely impossible for you to get those numbers. Which means what they're not doing, which is something that I generally disagree with wholeheartedly, uh, is talking to everybody. Many folks like to concentrate on. We'll talk to those. We we do the numbers and we see uh, you're a soft Democrat, a, a medium, and that's how they talk, right? I, I've never spoken that way. I've never campaigned that way. I've always campaigned. I talk to people. My question to you, are you, are you campaigning to people or are you campaigning to known demographics? So I started off, I'm going to be clear, I did start off with selecting known Democrats that I wanted to go out because I'm coming... I'm not coming off of a school board or city council. I won't have a big name here. And my first hurdle to overcome was name recognition. I need folks to know who I am so that they can be talking to their friends and neighbors about, hey, we've got this guy that we can actually vote for. So uh, I'll be clear. I did start off with talking to the Democratic uh, folks that I had a, a good knowledge of. Now, I am getting closer to the election and I'm casting a wider net. Um, I'm starting to talk to folks where I have less certainty of their uh, stance. And the message is very clear. I know how to make plants run better, cleaner and safer. If you don't like clean air, if you don't like people coming home at the end of the day safe, what are you here for? I mean, we want to work together to make sure that the plants are running the best, cleanest, safest they can because we appreciate what they do. We want the products and the benefits and that we enjoy coming from those facilities. There is no desire to shut them all down or any of the kind of narratives that we hear all the time. The goal is to go out and talk to folks and say, look, I've been in your shoes. I've personally crawled through process equipment. I've been all up and down distillation columns crawling on the inside of them after a turnaround to make sure that they're clean before we bolt them all back together again and start back up again. I know what the work is like. I've been there and I know that there are opportunities to make those plants run better, cleaner and safer. That's neither a Democratic message or a Republican message. It's a human message. Exactly right. And it seems to me that it is a message that uh, should be heard uh, and should be campaigned to, not just the uh, not just the people that you know are going to vote for you if they go out and vote, but for others who know that the person representing them today does not necessarily have those interests at hand because of the way uh, they've been meant to think. So I think I think it's both an education process as well as a, a familiarity process. People getting to know who uh, Chuck Cruz is, somebody that. Uh, don't look at me by labels. Look at me for uh, for what I actually stand for and what I intend to do for you. Now, give me a few uh, uh, what you want, uh, a few closing statements that you want uh, folks listening to this to hear. Number one, the guy that's in office right now is a lawyer. He is not an engineer. This area, House District 128, the major economic engine far and away is the petrochemical industry. We need a representative who actually represents us. If this district was the core and the heart of the legal industry, great. Maybe he'd be a better representative, but it's not. It's a petrochemical heavy industry, and we need a representative who knows the industry, knows what people are going through, knows what risks that they take, and wants to make it better, cleaner, and safer for everyone, not just the people inside the plants, but the people in the surrounding communities as well. How can people learn about you, Chuck? Uh, my website is a great spot, C-R-E-W-S, F-O-R-T-X.org, uh, Cruise for Texas. Um, that's a great spot. 
Um, I will be having a lot of signs coming up in the near future. I do have, oh, I just lost it. I had a <laughs> around here. Dang it. Oh, well. Um, but uh, my campaign signs are going to be cropping up all over the district very soon. Um, and I do have my social media outlets as well. So Twitter is where I'm most active. So I go Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, and then I've now got a TikTok as well. And most of them are C-R-E-W-S-F-O-R-T-X. Uh, to learn about me, check out where I stand on a lot of issues. Um, and if there are things that you don't see addressed that you want me to address, send me an email. It's at the bottom of my website. And that's going to be campaign at Cruz. For tx.org. Chuck Cruz, Democrat for Texas, House 128. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. It's an honor. Thank you very much, Egberto. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.